my name is Slava Levchenko. I'm Ukrainian. I'm a co-founder of Enango. I was in Kyiv and I didn't hear the noise of the first missiles. It was like 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. I don't remember. Uh, of so. course, it was a shock. So we were fully disoriented. I tried to understand what to do, whether to, uh, to go out from Kyiv or not. When we are fighting with a huge army and we are, I think, winning this war. So first part of my career, personal career, I spent in a corporate business inside marketing agency, working with multinationals. And several years ago, I jumped into startup field. And after the first start, I met my current co-founder, Andre. And my startup was quite local in Ukraine. And yeah, I was a bit tired from the marketing that was a specialization of my startup and uh, one goal has a head and has a big ambitious global vision yeah so we would like to build a, the big company or like a unicorn or even bigger and i liked it really much and i decided to make a exit from my startup where i was a key founder and um, joined the andre team being a, a co-founder of Enango. And it was three years ago. And from that time, yeah, one of the most active co-founders in Vengo are responsible for the sales, marketing, and fundraising strategy. So yeah, that's how we met. Can you just give a, a quick overview of what Van Go is? What's the problem you guys are trying to solve? What's the traction you've had? Let's just gonna start there. Oh yeah. So we had the several pilots. So we originally tried to build B2C business in the logistic, building some kind of Uber for people who would like to move goods from point A to point B, but using some vans. Yeah. And uh, that was initial idea because we were unsatisfied with the quality of delivery, especially in that part of, of the world. And then after the first year, we decided to move to B2B and currently we built and continue to build the software for those who has fleets. And we basically equip them with a software comparable with Amazon Flex software for delivery, for orchestrations and delivery business, for uh, software for end customers. So that's basically SaaS platform. And uh, that's what we do. In terms of traction, so before the war, we had most of the traction in the post-Soviet countries. It's uh, Ukraine, it's Kazakhstan, partially Azerbaijan, so post-Soviet countries, of course, out of Russian market and situation completely changed after the beginning of the war because we completely lost the traction in Ukraine. And we currently spent most of our efforts launching business in Poland, Romania, Germany, UK, and the US market. So we have currently first clients in Poland, in Romania, in Germany, but yeah, we would like to significantly expand our business in the Western part of the world. One thing that I think, I hope I have this right, but I believe one interesting aspect of your software would be if I have fleet, my own fleet today, that I'm doing deliveries, maybe I'm doing furniture deliveries or something like that. What your software allows me to do is to look to see who else is on the way and to supplement my delivery. So I'm able to take my fleet that was already going to be doing what they're doing and I'm able to basically fill that unused capacity with your software. Do I have that right? Yeah, that's one major idea that we build a platform. So we try to connect, we try to build the platform, which allow to collaborate. And in some cases, even the great word competition. Yeah, when we can combine several logistic companies, several within one platform and improve unit economy for all of them. So increase density of order, increase efficiency of the processes. Because what we see from our experience, from our cases, and from the statistics and research, there are a lot of wastage among different logistic companies because they simply use a not a transparent system when they need to spend a lot of time and efforts driving from point A to point B, while other company can be in that location and you can just share the information and use their capacity. Yeah, so we are building quite a difficult product. It's a B2B SaaS system uh, and logistic in, in general, it's a complicated story yeah but we see currently that there like a big demand and we have a lot of negotiations conversation and the range of companies is really different so from the small fleets to multinationals like la post and other companies who understand that they need the software they need to digitalize they need to reform their processes can you just talk a little bit about 
what the startup ecosystem looked like in Ukraine prior to the war. I know that there's a lot of really good engineering talent in Ukraine, and I know a lot of U.S. startups have partnered with people and agencies over there. But what was the ecosystem? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, in Ukraine, we had a quite unique environment for startups. So on the one hand, there is lack of investments. Simply because of some historical situations, so we don't have affordable financials for startup like angels, infrastructure, we see infrastructure, it's almost completely absent in Ukraine. But on the other hand, you mentioned that we have a lot of talents, e-talents, engineering talents, and the combination of these two factors lead to the situation when in tough conditions, we need to be more creative. We need to find more interesting ways because we simply tougher conditions. Like this famous quote that tough times create great people. So that's what was in Ukraine, that in really tough conditions, you need to be much more creative compared to the markets where when you can rise up the financial much easier. So that's why we have a quite interesting situation. So we are a poor country, but we have a, like big names among startups. Not everyone knows such names like GitLab, like Grammarly, Genesis, that's Ukrainian unicorns, Ukrainian startups. Or some acquisitions like Ring that was bought by Amazon or Luxury, they were bought by Snapchat. So that's Ukrainian startups. So we created quite great companies in the conditions really difficult for managing the business because of a lot of factors, like unfortunately corruption, or like not great legislation, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, we are great. But I would like to mention that before the war, like five years before the war situation became better for startups, I mean, in terms of infrastructure. So we were launched a lot of initiatives by government, by different institutions, we created some acceleration programs some associations for startups, et cetera, et cetera. Some funds were established. So it was a still early stage of the, I would say, infrastructure establishment, but it was much better compared to previous years. And the dynamic was huge. So we saw like huge growth of the startups, acceleration programs, et cetera. And I think, uh, yeah, after the war, it will speed up because I believe that there were a lot of investments into economy after the war. And there will be demand on like unique solutions. There will be better legislation because we see now that under the pressure of some institutions, we reform our, our legislation, some rules, and I believe it will be much better for startups to launch, do the business after the war. Yeah, that's a really interesting piece because I think for better or for worse, it's been much easier to start a business in the U.S. You have access to capital here. And so it's not uncommon for someone to say, hey, have an idea give me a million dollars for me to try to figure this out. And they may not have good unit economics or they may not have a really good go-to-market plan. But what I'm hearing from you is that in Ukraine, you don't have that million dollar cushion. It's like, okay, I have an idea. Let me go out and actually build it, work for free, have some basic unit economics, have a reasonable business that is profitable and then go get investment. And so I think maybe the number of companies being started is a lot lower because some of these ideas are being weeded out before the investment's coming through. But it sounds like the companies that, that did exist were much stronger and you know, were in a much better shape. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. And one more additional factor that the size of the Ukrainian market is really small. So when you have at least a positive unit economic, you immediate economics, you immediately trying to look outside of Ukraine. So you're trying to enter the EU market, US market. So that's one of the reasons why we have a successful names because yeah, Ukraine is a comparatively cheap market for experimenting, find the right business model. And then if you have a startup mindset, you would like to grow fast, you're immediately trying to approach new markets outside of Ukraine. No, that's great. I agree with you. Yeah. So let's fast forward a little bit, because I know that things change pretty dramatically first in 2014 and then about a year ago. This was when we were working together. We were working with an accelerator. I was providing some mentorship as you guys were looking to enter the U.S. market. And from my perspective, I've had a very personal connection to this whole thing. So I think we started in December of 21 and we were meeting for a couple of times a week for a few months there. And I remember seeing things in the U.S. media about buildup of Russian troops or an imminent invasion. And kind of seemed that from your perspective, say, hey, this is the same thing it's been since 2014. It's not a big deal. This is just the media blowing out of proportion. And, and then things changed. 
Can you just talk about what that moment looked like for the first run up to the invasion? Yeah, first of all, it's an interesting date that the war started tomorrow. Yeah, I don't know whether we selected this date deliberately or not, but yeah, there are a lot of memories that came up in my mind yesterday and today. I remember that there, there were a lot of talks when you are constantly living in a situation where you have some, some risks of the invasions, like during the months or years, you start to, how do you say, to get used to it. And it is difficult for brain to constantly be in stress. I wouldn't say that we were completely relaxed. That's not true. For instance, I kept my car full because, yeah. yeah, I had this scenario in my mind. I didn't understand that there can be some situation when I need to have this full gas, my emergency backpack in my car. But I tried to not think constantly about that. Smiling, yeah, inspire my team because, yeah, it's a human nature. We can't be constantly in the stress. It's very difficult. And that happened. I remember that I was in Kiev and I didn't hear the noise of the first missiles, but I had a call from Andre. He was in Munich that time. He read it in news. It was like 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. I don't remember. So from him, I, I get the information about the war. That was an interesting moment. Yeah, and of course, it was a shock. So we were fully disoriented. I tried to understand what to do, whether to to go out from Kiev or not. The first day, it's the 24th of February, we spent in Kiev. And next day, we decided to move outside of Kiev to the western part of Ukraine. And we spent some time there. So each probably week was quite different. So for some time, I decided to tell my family, my wife and two kids to go to Poland. And they spent next three months in Poland while I lived in the western part of Ukraine. In terms of team, I think there were some probably two weeks of full gap in communication. So we were fully disoriented. We took care of help to the people, some tickets, some coordination of the information, ways everyone, what how we can help with money, with some apartments, etc. Because some people were in really hot spots of the war. Some people were in Kharkiv, which was on the huge attack. So in Kyiv, situation was comparably okay. But yeah, there was a different situation. And yeah, after the first weeks of this like frustration and shock, we started to think about what to do with business. So we, fortunately, we had a Kazakhstan team. And yeah, they just continued to, to do their job. So they just continue operating, generate some revenue. And I think for us, it was great because I know startups that had almost all traction in Ukraine. So they closed their business. So they simply didn't survive because they were really early stage and fully all, almost all traction were in Ukraine. So we were like lucky we had this traction in Kazakhstan. Yeah, and then we started to think what to do, how we can help our people, how we can support Ukrainians. And then we realized that we are a logistic company. And logistics is a big part of the war. This famous quote that I don't remember who told, but uh, yeah, the logistic can help to win the war because you need to fastly move goods, stuff like military stuff, humanitarian stuff, etc. But of course, we are not a military startup. So we weren't able to like, I don't know, move tons or something like that. So we focused our efforts on the humanitarian goods. So we provided with the software companies who would like to deliver goods to the hotspots. Also, we dedicate some particular part of the team to coordinate the drivers, to find drivers, to find people outside of Ukraine who can bring some goods. And that was quite a wide range of goods. It was uh, food, it was like some hygienic stuff. It was like some semi-military stuff, some spare parts for some military stuff. So it was wide range. And the deliveries was in a really hot spot. It was Dnipro, Kharkiv, Kherson, cities. There was a war, there was fights. And yeah, our careers and drivers, they were really brave people to deliver goods in that hot spots. Yeah, and there was a demand, quite big demand. We had a lot of orders, a lot of different items, etc. And the reason behind that was because, like, the government wasn't ready for the war. So logistic chains were broken, etc. 
So they needed some time to establish these logistic chains. And what we saw that in May, in the end of the May, the number of orders or requests almost stopped. So these two months, we were really needed for the country, for the people. But then the government, uh, they started to do this function by themselves. And we realized that, yeah, we did it, did what we can, and now we can fully focus on our business. And from May, we started to make a pivot in terms of business development. And we came back to the strategy, came back to the operations. We started to think what to do next. And of course, we, we did some stuff in parallel. Like we tried to understand where we can raise some funds, some grants, etc. And one of the interesting moments was this program of Google uh, on the level of top management. They decided to support Ukrainian startups. And they established the Ukrainian Startup Fund. And so there was some competition. And we were among the first bench of startups who won these competitions. It was in Warsaw. And they gave us a grant of 100,000 US dollars. And it was in May. So in April, we participated. In May, we won. Yeah. And for us, this grant, I wouldn't say that the amount of money was game changing, but the fact that uh, Google believed in our startup, it inspired us significantly. It inspired us, gave us some belief that we will survive because we still were in a really difficult situation. And from that time, we accelerate our development in Europe, on board first clients, etc. So from May, our new story began in Europe. I would say. I want to go back to just those first couple of months because it sounds, and I don't want to embellish this, but it really does sound like you guys stepped into a void that didn't exist. There was no logistical support for victims, for front lines, for the first couple of months of the war. And it sounds like without you or companies like you, the human toll could have been astronomical. Do you recognize the impact that your business had? to your fellow countrymen is something that was that significant or is it just, Hey, I was doing my part and this was a way I could help. Second one. I have a lot of friends because I was an active participant of the revolution in 2013, 2014. So that not my first experience of like helping, like volunteering, helping other people. So in Ukraine, it's a culture. We have this spirit of fight here yeah, against some problems. And I saw that. Immediately, within a few days, almost everyone from my circle, they started participating in this movement. And it was a huge range of different movements. Some people participating in fights, some people like trying to find funds, etc. But everyone tried to do something. And I can explain why. Because in the critical, stressful situation, you need to do something. Otherwise, it's crazy. It's difficult to live in this environment. And when you are doing something, when you are making some impact, helping other people in a critical situation, it's just easier for you. That's not a matter when you're thinking that you are doing some huge mission, something like unique. You just need to do it because otherwise it's difficult to live in this situation. I know a lot of similar companies, people who did more than we done, people who did less, but it's the result of the current situation when we are fighting with a huge army and we are, I think, winning this war, we'll win this war is because almost everyone in Ukraine participated in this war. So the functions are different. Some can do bigger, some less, but it's 40 million people, maybe less, maybe 30 million of people. I don't know currently, but it's a huge amount. It's not just an army or just some government. Yeah, it's a matter of people. So that's why we are not, I don't know anyone who consider their participation in helping Ukrainian people as a something unique or something like without what wouldn't happen. It's just our, I don't know, <laughs> we just, just have to do this. It, it sounds like so many times people can be so concerned about doing a big part in something that they discount the small parts. And what you're saying is that everybody chipped in some people a little bit, some people a lot different ways, but that's really the difference. And I, I think that that might've been underestimated by the invading force. Do you have any stories or just memories when you were running that humanitarian logistics network in those hot zones that come to mind of just 
things that made you take pause and say, wow, we're really helping or we're really making a difference here? Yeah, we were different situations. Some were each delivery that times was like you're solving some equation because it wasn't like a typical process from point A to point B. There were always a small challenge to do the particular delivery. There was a situation when we deliver from the US to the Spain, from Spain to Poland, from Poland to the border, after the border to Lviv, from Lviv to Kyiv, from Kyiv to Kharkiv. And each part, it was a new equation. So you need to find the driver, vehicle, et cetera, et cetera. So it was really difficult. And in terms of like recognitions, yeah, we had like some funny stuff like these diplomas from the local authorities that we are grateful for, that you support us, like a piece of paper, but yeah, it was like a recognition. And of course, people, when they thank you for these uh, the photos with some people who are like, I remember that we delivered some food for some kitchen on the front line yeah, near the fights. And it's a simple women, but yeah, they were so brave to be there and cooking. Yeah, and they were grateful for us, for our function, but that's how it works. So everyone do their part of their uh, process, but each one is really important. So like several women cooking for the soldiers, they are not less important than we a logistic company with a software, with IT infrastructure. No, without them, it wouldn't be possible to do this. So that's why on one hand, it's really touchy story. Yeah. But on the same, on the other hand, yeah, it was difficult. So currently when I try to remember, so it was difficult, a lot of difficult situation. Yeah. There are a lot of memories and yeah, not always it was a really like good and romantic. Yeah. I'm sure that not every delivery went as planned. Can you talk a little bit about since May, once the government started to take over those central logistics functions? How have either you as a Ukrainian or your team or your company viewed your role in supporting the effort or supporting the people? How's that changed? So firstly, I need to mention that from the beginning, we had a omen circle, so our team. And for us, it was important to try to keep our team, to help our team. So that was a, like a basic function for us. And we support each other. That also helped us. Then in May and later on, we understand that, yeah, we are not so useful for our people in terms of technology, in terms of other stuff. We can fully focus on our story, our business. But in spite of the fact that we have a European legal entity, we are in every acceleration or some meetup or any conference, we position ourselves as a Ukrainian startup. And we believe that it's also important to tell this and to tell that, yeah, everything is okay in Ukraine. So yeah, currently it's a temporary situation, but in general, we have great companies, great people. We are doing great stuff and Ukraine is doing well. And of course, it's a risky investment currently to consider Ukrainian companies. But in general, we are a great country, great people, great businesses, and we promote talents. We promote our sector yeah, as an IT logistics startup. So we try and on every stage to promote that we are Ukrainians, that we are Ukrainian business. And it's, despite the fact that we suffer from a lot of stuff, yeah, we are still working. I remember some funny stuff in summer when I was in Kiev, I had some calls with these people from the, all over the world and in many cases, they, they were surprised that I have an internet. Yeah, it was funny because yeah, you start getting used to I think I was one of those people. Just like, are you okay? Are you there? Maybe it was an early stage, but in summer, it was more or less okay. Yeah, but in general, perception, we don't want to have the perception of Ukraine as a country which like fully destroyed after the war. So we have a big problem, but it's still a part of Ukraine still a, a tra tragedy, but we believe that after the end of the war, we will be successful country and we need to promote our ecosystem, our people, our businesses, our talents. So we try to do this. We are, as I mentioned, we are not a military startup or business. We can't actively participate in the war currently, but we do what we can at this stage. When the war does end and we move from litigating the war to rebuilding the country. You mentioned earlier about some of the core pieces of infrastructure that help the startup ecosystem. What would you hope stays the same and what would you hope is different as Ukraine begins to rebuild itself? There is a 
big positive side effect from the relocation of a lot of Ukrainians outside. So a lot of people decided to stay in Spain, UK, US, Canada. And suddenly during the year, we built a huge network of Ukrainians all over the world. And that if we will use this network in a proper way, that will really help Ukrainian businesses. Because I know a lot of people, they started networking in different places throughout the world and the Ukrainians are interconnected and we can use this. And those who, who plan to build the business in Ukraine, they will set up much better connection, much better access to the knowledge, to the infrastructure, startup infrastructure. And for them, it will be much easier. And even currently, I see this. I'm currently do the mentorship for Lviv IT cluster in the Western part of Ukraine. It's a really early stage. So it's just the MVP or idea. I see that it's a new generation. It's a people, they are thinking globally. They are not trying to build a local business from, from scratch. They immediately thinking about the global market. And yeah, they are looking immediately connection outside of Ukraine. So that's why I believe it will be better. And of course, I hope that the access to the capital will be better for Ukraine. Ukrainian startups. Yeah. And that's important part of the story, I believe. That's great. Kind of Ukraine as a launch pad to scaling in the rest of the world is what you're saying. Maybe. Hope so. I'm curious, obviously this has been a, and it continues to be a life defining event for millions of Ukrainians as, as well as founders. And there may be some entrepreneurs that are watching this and are going through their own difficult time, but you can't compare trying to run a company in a war zone. What are some lessons or how has your business changed as a result of going through the experience that you've gone through? I would say that in terms of perception, like personal perception, every pain is painful. Yeah. You can't be different. The war is, it, it's a tragedy. Any tragedy is difficult. So every crisis is difficult. And startup founders, they usually pass a lot of crises, especially serial ones who are building the second, third startup. And in our situation, when we were this first month of the full stress, shock, frustration, the recipe was quite simple. Just keep going. Just keep the ball rolling and continue to do some small stuff every day. So not thinking about this, not trying to analyze this stuff. Just do some simple steps, one step, then another step. And suddenly in some point you understand that you pass some kilometer or two kilometers from this like edge where you were. And yeah, that's not something new, but you need to just do this. And of course you need a people, your circle of founders, like close people who can support you because among our founders, there were some different ideas. Someone came up with this idea of volunteering. Someone came up with this idea to apply on a Google program, another one with another idea. And yeah, that was like a construction. You try to have some shoulder of your co-founder and try to avoid the full frustration. I don't know how to explain it, but yeah, you, you support each other and it gives you the power to move forward because when you are alone, it's really difficult. It's really difficult to pass the, the critical, especially dark times that we passed. So yeah, that's my, probably my recipe of these dark times. I think you just dropped a whole bunch of wisdom there. Cause I think the first thing that really resonated with me is you acknowledge that pain is pain, right? I shouldn't try to compare my difficulty trying to fundraise for a startup with your difficulty in trying to run a war zone. They're both difficult in very different ways, different extremes. But I think as founders, so many times we have to put on this persona that everything is cotton candy and unicorns, everything's fine, nothing is bad, and it doesn't get to you. But it can be a very lonely, very difficult place to be. And I think what you're teaching us is that you should acknowledge that it's a difficult situation. And, and my difficulty and my ability to bear those difficulties may be different from yours. Maybe one more. Yeah, the purpose. So I think that's important when you really believe that your product has some purpose. So it helps you to pass these difficulties and start times. So do you mean probably, purpose beyond just making money? No, what do you mean by, or is it more focus? Not money, not about money. Some mission that you would like to change the world. I believe that's like a great word, like to change the world. But when you believe that your product, your business 
are doing something truly important for not only for your pocket yeah but for people that's really help you not to give up yeah because it's not only about you but it's always easier to give up when it's a matter of you only but when you believe that you can help others you can change something for better that's give you some more strength to move forward that's also important did you find that your purpose as a company changed over the last 18 months? Yes, I think yes. Yeah. Before the war, we weren't so sure about our mission, our purpose, our positioning, I would say. And of course, a lot of meetings, connections, cases during this year gave us a better understanding of this. I can say that's something about product market fit. But the product market fit is basically when you understand what you are what you are solving. Yeah, when you understand this, you understand your mission, your purpose, your value for the customer. And for startups, it's not obvious. In many cases, you can some hypothesis, but when you are trying to sell it, trying to find customers, you fix, you change it, and in some moment you understand that's how it brings the value. And yeah, we understood better during this journey. And currently we are much more confident in what we are selling, what the value we are bringing to the customers. And it allow us to be more efficient in sales in the end of the day. Do, so, do you think that you would have found your purpose had you not gone through a period of extreme adversity? Maybe there are some lucky people who found their purpose without passing difficulties, but that's, I think, real case. The way of startup is a way of finding something that no one before them has found. And you can found it without making some mistakes, some difficulties, because you are trying to build something unique, something that nobody built before you. So how you can find it without mistakes, without faults. So I think, no, I think you, you need to pass it. You have to pass it. That's the only way. Yeah, I love that. If you had to define what the Ukrainian mindset is as a startup founder that everybody else in the world should learn from and take from, how would you define the Ukrainian mindset? Ukrainians, historically, we are quite, we love freedom. And freedom, on one hand, it's good for entrepreneurs, for businesses, but in terms of building the government, building the rules, it's not really good. So that's why we have some issues with corruption. But for startups, that's the mindset that we love this feel of freedom that we can disrupt current rules, current business, can find something new. So we are not afraid about the changing stuff. And that's what I think should have every founder, not afraid about the changes, about the experimenting, about the trying something new. Even if you think that it's a completely like established segment, I don't know, taxi segment was before Uber. Yeah. So it's just illusion that the stability is just illusion. So you can always improve something. You can always change the rules and make it better. So I think this love to the freedom, to the improvement, to the changes, to the hard work, it's about Ukrainians. We really like it. We really love it. And that's, I think, important treats for many founders, I would say. That's wonderful. This has been an awesome conversation. Thank you so much for all the pearls of wisdom. If people are interested in learning more about Van and Go or connecting with you, what's the best way to do that? And I guess, go ahead and give me your pitch for why people should sign up for you here in the US. I wouldn't say that I'm really active in social media currently. After the beginning of the war, I rarely active on the media, but in general, currently, yeah, I'm trying to share my thoughts in Ukrainian media platform, etc. Yeah, I think I will be more active in LinkedIn, so you can find me there. In our web page, we have a blog where we publish some articles, but it's specifically about the industry, about our product. But yeah, basically, I think we're going to getting also interesting because we are talking there not only about the product, but about the people, about the events where we participate, activities. So it's a wide range. So yeah, I invite you to follow us in the internet. I think it's the easiest way nowadays. That's great. Any any last words of wisdom or anything that you'd like to talk about before we wrap? Yeah, I think I told maybe, I don't remember whether I told you in the beginning that 
for me, it was a big surprise, the support of the U.S. people that time. So I talked with a lot of people and I was surprised that we have such a big distance. Yeah, you are on another age of the world. Yeah, comparing with Ukraine. So you are not Poland, which is on the border of Ukraine. But I felt a lot of support from the U.S. people. And that for me was like a huge moment. And for me, um, it's currently like a friendly market, friendly country. And uh, so I'm currently applying on the U.S. visa a second time because... My interview was canceled due to war last year, and I hope to visit U.S. in a few months because, yeah, and it will be my first visit, and I hope to meet you, Aaron, in person and to be more... Yeah, let me know which city you're in, and I will go meet you, and we can continue this conversation. This is great. For entrepreneurs, the first city in U.S. which you would like to visit, it will be San Francisco, of course. So Silicon Valley, yeah, I, I would like to start from there. And second, second place, of course, it's New York. Sounds good. We'll get some dumplings in San Francisco and some pizza in New York. Great. But this is uh, this has been really great. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. It was like really great to share my thoughts, my experience and some memories. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I've been thinking of you often. I'm glad to hear that you're safe and hopefully your family is able to join you soon. Because I really think you've got a great story. to. I'm excited to have been a very small part of that story, but I really want to help you guys. And I think this is a unique way of helping you get some more traction in the U.S. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Okay. All right. Good. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aaron.